So, hey there, everyone, and welcome to February's This Month in Procurement. So, I'm Philip Heidson, host of Art of Procurement, and I'm joined, as ever, by my co-host, Mark Pereira, co-founder and CEO of Old Street Lab. So, Mark, welcome. Good to see you again. Oh, so, and we're doing video now, so we can we can see each other, which is cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not sure the hair or the tan or anything looks good. So, um, but yeah, good to good to hear from you as well. Yeah, no, um, that's uh, everyone can get scared now of you know what it looks like to actually do this. It sounds like when you're doing it on just audio, and you know, for people that are uh, listening just on audio, then you know they still have that. It probably sounds a lot more professional than uh, they come and see how actually it's made and it's <laughs> here we are, kind of chatting from our houses, but. Good to actually do yeah, it. You know, I'm, uh, we're, we're, we just finished off some uh, decoration. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of uh, redecorating in the front room at the moment. So that's uh, that's where I am today. And you'll see that those, uh, those AirPods mm-hmm. finally came along. So we'll see how good the audio is. It's day two uh, without wires um, and uh, less dongles in my life as well. So are they falling out yet? No, they haven't fallen out. So uh, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're good. Um, other than the fact we use Skype, in, uh, not Skype, we use Slack internally. Mm-hmm. So not so great on that but uh, no no they're good i'll give you a, a proper review in right. uh, a month's time if i still got them they're good mm-hmm. if i haven't got them and back on the cables then you know the outcome yeah the jury's still out whether it's kind of the going running with them that i'm concerned about and them falling out but well yeah i'm not doing too much running at the moment so <laughs> I that shit. um so what have, what's been going on the last month it's been a busy month. I think we were kind of mid-January when we did the, uh, yeah. the first one. So, um, yeah, no, it's been busy, um, uh, I guess, just on, on the old street side. Um, a number of really cool hires. So, uh, excellent designer joined us, and uh, we just brought a, a really cool guy in on account management side mm-hmm. from uh, Oracle Eloquest. So, some cool people joining the, the business um, and some, some really good deployments of uh, new features out there as well. So, that's been keeping me me busy. And uh, a little bit too much travel, so yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't been to any events, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to. I think it's the week after next, going to the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So I'm there for a few days. Um, so that'll be cool. So lots of cool technology there. Mm-hmm. Um, meeting up with some of the procurement execs and, and connecting up with the, the network there. But uh, yeah. And very much new tech. I don't think I bought a new phone, so I can't buy anything new there. Right. Um, so you say. That's what I tell my wife. <laughs> yeah. So we'll you come home with something. <laughs> yeah, and a little bit of sun. And you're in you're right. in wet San Diego, but um, it's uh, a little bit grey and and uh, uh, not so nice here in London. So it'll be nice to hopefully go to Barcelona and get out of the conference and, and see yeah. a bit of sun whilst I'm down there. Yeah, we've had a couple of days of clouds, so you know we're ready for some sunshine. Uh, yeah, well, I've, I've been hearing from Jordan, uh, mm-hmm. who's based down in San Diego, uh, about all the rain there. So uh, um, that's cool. And then uh, Alex Shaw, my co-founder, has just come back from uh, San Francisco. So he's been here for the week. So it's great to catch up with him um, and uh, hear about his uh, his passion for kale. He's gone to San Francisco oh, really? and <laughs> seems to be a super healthy person now. He's living um, the that, California that was... lifestyle, the cliche California lifestyle. Yeah, I think I need to get out there. So, uh, yeah, no, it's cool. All good. Good. How about yourself? What's been keeping you busy last year? Yeah. Um, so I've been working on some learning and development programs um, for um, a couple of clients, you know, one specifically around supply risk. I think it's a really important topic. It's something we'll probably get into, actually, in the show a little bit. You know, with everything that's going on geopolitically, lots of unknown unknowns and uncertainty and kind of helping organizations think a little bit about how they understand what the risks are in the supply chain, how they plan to um, kind of understand what they are, how they track them, and then what you can do to mitigate some of the risks. So, you know, no company can focus on managing all of their risks all the time. So it's about how do you identify the ones that are probably going to be most material and at least have something in place that um, you can predictively get ahead of it. And even if you haven't, you've got a plan in place when something happens that you can kind of deploy as soon as it does happen. So I'm spending a lot of time on that. It's an interesting space. There's some, um, some cool companies. So we're doing some stuff on that as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Mark, who heads up a data scientist side, but um, there's a team over at Risk Methods as well. I'm not sure if you've spoken to them. No, um, I know of them, but I've never spoken to them. Yeah, cool guys. So uh, you sh- I should hook you up with yeah. uh, with Heiku, who's the uh, one of the founders there. But they're doing some cool stuff. Um, I think this is where the, the you know the, the machine learning and the algorithms sort of right. stuff kick in. But someone has to predict when Brexit is going to happen. So um, that's you know 
that's part of the thing. It's I like, do that. There's, there's all these unknown unknowns. So I was doing an interview uh, for Procurious. Actually, I'm doing a podcast series for Procurious as part of the Big Idea Conference. And I think that's probably going to be live when this goes out. Um, and I was speaking with an economist and also with uh, Nick Gowing, who's um, ex-broadcaster for the BBC, but also he's really put together a movement called Think the Unthinkable. And it's all around the fact that these unknown unknowns and black swans are just happening with more and more regularity that you have to, you know, you can't think that something isn't going to happen, that you're okay, that you're kind of putting your head in the sand. Um, You've got to start thinking about what's the worst case and then at least prepare for it. So if it doesn't happen, then at least, you know, you're not going to be caught out by something that does happen. And also thinking more about known, so unknown knowns, is it? Or is it's known unknown. So it's things you know yeah. kind of <laughs> that are out there, but you don't really know what the impact is going to be. Um, so it's building some optionality ar- around your supply chain so that when something does happen again, at least you're prepared for that. No, it's a really interesting space. So, and I'm going to have to pick your brain. So actually a broadcaster contacted me um, today. Um, right. they're, doing, they're doing a series around risk for uh, businesses and they... They want me to uh, to be part of the series, so um, I have to get my my hair cut mm-hmm. and, uh, and sort myself out for that. But uh, yeah, I'm speaking tomorrow, so I think oh. they're moving fairly quickly on it. So uh, I'll let you know the details, and then I'll, I'll yeah. give you a secret phone call, and you can give me all the de- all, all the right. stuff that you've been teaching everyone else. Well. I'm sure you don't need me to make you sound smart, so you'll be fine. <laughs> I don't know. I work around the world <laughs> using other people's information to make me sound smarter. Right. The only way it's going to work. So, um, you know, when we look at the themes this week, or this month even, I had four things down and, you know, we'll see if we get to them all, um, just, you know, how we go for time. But one was around alternative, alternative facts. And I was inspired to um, really think about the procurement press. And it was, you know, with all that's going on in the Trump administration and what's a fact, what's fake news, what's real, what's not, you know, how does that apply to procurement? Then um, I want to talk a little bit about an article that really resonated with me a couple of weeks ago that Alex, your co-founder, actually wrote about. Um, it's about procurement's new dawn. Then uh, we're going to touch on just some of the key findings from the Deloitte CPO survey came out a couple of weeks ago. And then if time allows, and um, we'll, we'll kind of touch on Trump again, but talk about trade agreements and talk a little bit more about supply risk, as I alluded to before. So that's kind of what I had on my uh, to do list today. I don't know if there's anything else on there that uh, you wanted to touch on. That's, that sounds perfect. I'm, I'm sure we'll go in. Uh, we'll go out this I way know. and come back <laughs> anyway. So I'm not. I'm not going to add anything now. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add in as we go. Yeah. So we start there and, and we'll find out that we only really touch on one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. So sounds the good. the first one was um, procurement press, and so you know it can be a pretty delicate topic given how much into kind of twineness there is between the folks in procurement that cover the space plus the service providers who are in the space. And as I say, I was kind of inspired when I was thinking about the inauguration and the fact that um, there was a debate about crowd sizes. And, you know, anybody who didn't agree with the administration were, were basically pursuing alternative facts. Um, given your experience, you know, founding procurement leaders, you know, being involved in procurement leaders, where do you think we are in terms of the health of the procurement press at the moment? So I probably should know more about that and read about it more. Um, let's say I think it's, it's got a lot more diverse than it was because mm-hmm. uh, in the early days it was, it was spend matters kind of being the more open one. Uh, procurement leaders came along and started creating it and then there's just been a flood of, of more press right. out there. So I think, um, yeah, I think this. I guess who's the BBC of the? Uh, of, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna say we're gonna take the high ground. I'll say procurement leaders are the kind yep. of BBC high quality journalism. Mm-hmm. Someone else may may shoot me down for that. Um, good research, X Y Z, and then um, spend matters. You know, good. Uh, probably a lot more uh, technology focused mm-hmm. with the, the parts. A lot of more shared research um, as well. So, and then just a flurry outside. I think everyone's trying to create content now, which is news or, yeah. or whatever it's off so i think it's there i think some of this if you look at the fake news uh, and i won't go into details because i don't know the, who's lobbying who at the moment but number of suppliers and, and networks 
um, yeah. is one interesting fact. Um, so again, let's name some names. You know, the 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 Rebus, the Coopers, the Trochis. I, I, and again, there's lots of others. Uh, yeah. There's a kind of a <clears throat> there's a point there around who's who's got the largest numbers, and then you can say the active or the the not as well. So I think that's interesting, and I'm not sure if there's any audit on that as mm-hmm. well. So um, that's like I guess one of the things that in terms of fake news um, or or I guess technology is a, a really important part of, of any function and any business. I mean, I, I saw the Gartner sourcing yeah. magic wave thing came out <laughs> recently. And um, and then you got the CB. I think we talked about that side. So there's kind of a consolidation of those two decision-making companies. But I looked at that sourcing one, and I think uh, Peter over at uh, – or Jason, probably more into Ben Manners, was, was looking at that and, and saying – some of the um, exclusions from it uh, as well, and, and it kind of made me think. You know, the the way they structure, you know, a certain amount of revenue from multiple different right. markets, all those kind of things. And then um, you know, you got Stan and um, and Alex over at Scout RFP, really good guys. Their product is awesome. Yeah, yeah it's a good, really good sourcing product. And um, you know, if I was uh, if I was looking for a sourcing tool, I, I'd be going to Scout RFP now. They haven't probably they haven't got the price tag of some of the other ones right. out there, and, and rightfully so. They've done something which is better and cheaper, um, and, and they don't even get coverage on the the sourcing um, mm. magic quadrant. So, I think those quadrants are dated. And if you look at fake news, is it worse than the fake news that that and people still look at those quadrants and say, "Oh, where do you sit on the right. quadrant?" Right. Now, you know, I, I'd hope procurement people can actually go beyond someone telling them that you only can you only can pick from this <laughs> yeah. full box it should be <laughs> only if you're in there. that box you're important if you're not on that you don't matter you don't exist you're right. not in the quadrant um so i worry a lot around that around decision making mm. or around technology um i'm hoping you know and, and and also the emissions from those types of parts so there's only the p2p one and then sourcing so there are there is no technology outside right. of that um that's worrying um and also i think there's a maturity level not just in that sector but if that that buying process goes in the corporates and we know that they're looking for competitive advantages more agile solutions with the ai and so forth yeah. and, that, and actually that's not coming from the ones in the, right. in the quadrant so where do they get the information and the decision making on that as well so i think it's that there are a few uh, companies out there where you, we should if i can find them put them on the links mm-hmm. uh, below in the article there but I think that's an interesting part. So I think there's fake news and then the, the decision support side of kind of these analysts. Yeah. Um, I think that needs to change as well. Um, so that's that's one of my things that maybe a little bit off, off the cuff. What about yourself? What do you, do you see? Yeah, so I guess one of the things I've always seen, and you know, I think about this now when I do this, uh, the link email that I do every week. It's this week in procurement. And I look at all the writing that's out there in the procurement field every week and you know, try and pick what I think is at least some some good stories, some good insights that we all as a profession should uh, should be reading. And you know, that's obviously just my opinion because it's all in the eye of the beholder. But you know, eighty percent of the stuff I see is all it's just sponsor driven and it's almost like um, it's a front for just, you know, part of a funnel. It's basically the top of somebody's funnel. It's an advertorial. You know, you can kind of tell at the beginning of the article and at the end. If you look at the beginning and the end, see how it's set up and at the end is, you know, who it's from and what the call to action is at the end. It gives you a good idea of, you know, whether that's truly insight or whether it's just part of some marketing. So one of the difficult things I think for us all is to kind of find the bits of information that are relevant, that are helpful, that are insightful. Um, and it's also interesting to me, you know, as I talk from a content perspective and creating content with the art of procurement is, uh, you know, I'm kind of dabbled in a sponsorship driven model. I'm not sure how, you know, how sustainable sponsorship driven models are in the procurement space anymore. And on the other hand, you know, there's a need for unbiased coverage and insights, but that's expensive. And I don't necessarily see any other business models coming along where professionals will pay from a subscription model, for example, for insightful information that is bias free. So it kind of, to me, it's really, it's going to be interesting to see how things go. If content providers are able to move away from being sponsor 
led or whether really the sponsors who are the companies that are being covered are really going to be funding and you know, continuing to fund a lot of the information that's out there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think it's a good point. Um, the model that I wrote, so look, put it this way, when we set up procurement leaders, we always had the editorial mm -hmm. break. So I was the editor of the magazine and I, I wasn't allowed to touch any of the sponsorship stuff. And then I don't know, we've had three or four editors and we've already kept it ed absolutely yeah. uh, clear uh, and also try to do that the, around the events as well. Um, and and then, then I launched the Procurement Intelligence Unit, which is now the research arm of Procurement yeah. Leaders. Um, and our customers paid for that independence as well. Um, so I think, yeah, so again, paid for it. So, and then if you take it back to kind of your position in the market, I really like what Ben Thompson does. And um, so that's his ex exponent F FM, mm -hmm. the podcast. Yeah. And then he does his, you know, bi daily uh, or bi weekly, uh, a few times a week, emails. And he is an analyst. He goes really deep into yeah. these, these articles. And I pay, I don't know, $10 a, a month. Mm -hmm. And it was actually uh, Matt over at Airbnb who got it onto me. So, so you, you know, just, just read some of these. Um, and so, so that's the model I, I, I think. And I think that's just growing. And you've got some of the tech news that do the yeah. same now. Um, I, I don't subscribe to those. I subscribe to Ben Thompson. But um, so that's the one I do subscribe to. And I read his stuff. I know that if I pick up that email on my phone, um, it's going to just enrich me. And he, right. he gets really deep right. into those things. So I think that's what people care and will pay for. And it may be, you know, $10 or £10 a month. Mm -hmm. But you, you're doing something really deep. And you don't need a big team around you. Right. But you, you can do that. So I, I think now, does that work for corporates? Um, they, you know, procurement leaders right. and some of those things where they can take it across the business and they get account management. It's different. But I think at least in in, in that side, or maybe individual subscribe at that amount, five, ten dollars a month mm -hmm. um, for some really good insight coming through to them. I think it comes through, and they're willing to pay for it. They always can unsubscribe as well, which is good. Part. So. I'd like to see more of that and then mm -hmm. individual expertise coming through because, you, you know, it's, you look at a consultancy, there might be two great partners in there and some principals in there, but it's not, doesn't mean the whole, everyone in right. that practice is awesome. Yeah. They're just and showcasing they the best have, of the best. Yeah. You know, so I like, I, I, I think companies, big corporates, when they, they look to get consultancy advice should actually find the individuals that, mm -hmm. that have, are really the specialists in it. And I looked at it in the supply chain finance side. There's a few consultancies were talking about the, the, the depth of knowledge back in 2008 when it was all kicking off. It was really quite thin. Yeah. But there were a few individuals who just knew it inside right. out. Um, and also, you know, we're talking about, I think we, we had them at Procurement Leaders. There's one person who's just really good on Microsoft licensing. So if you if you want to negotiate with right. Microsoft, uh, I think it was that lady, she just knew it inside out. And you didn't need to try and have that expertise within your, your four walls. Mm -hmm. um, you just brought that person in right. and you paid a day rate and right. they were going to have a, I don't know what X return on it, but just exponentially amount right. there. So I guess that's what we need to start looking at in terms of post news, people mm -hmm. with the real knowledge and maybe you need to subscribe to a few, but overall it comes out um, there as well. And it, you, you know, I think more people are subscribing to, you know, out of procurement and gain that knowledge through as well. But, you know, it's always about the quality of the content. Right. Um, that, and, uh, I, I know yeah, um, consistency as well. Yeah, we looked at um, doing something that was subscription-based and um, you're just having additional content behind the firewall or doing things like, you know, pulling out. So we have these 30 to 45 minute interviews, but there's so much insight in there that kind of gets missed. And so it's a way of pulling out some of the key things from that and having that available in some kind of subscription model. And to be honest, it's something that's still on the agenda. It's just one of those things that is probably a lot of work in doing and, you know, with unknown returns. So it's just not something that's been the area of focus. But I think that that kind of model, if if procurement professionals are ultimately willing to pay, because that's the other thing is, you know, as procurement people, we, we like to try and get as much as we can, um, you know, without having to pay that much money for it. So that's always a question. But I think that's definitely a model that, could sustain a you know an unbiased a sponsor free media site yeah i also i also think youtube is really interesting mm. now and uh just creating those videos on youtube and uh turning on the ads and not worrying about right. asking 
certain company for it. Now, I'm not sure, 10,000 views of a, a video, uh, it gives you a return of $10, I don't know. So talking about procurement risk, um, mm -hmm. maybe we should search on Google and say what's the top number of views mm -hmm. on it. But We need to create it, a procurement it, reality show or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, if you just followed Alex and uh, <laughs> and some of his, his 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 meetings in San Francisco, uh, that's good. Uh, but I think yeah, you know, it's an interesting one of how do you monetize this stuff. Right. But people get it for free. I think that's the other part is you know we're, we're creating content. Um, the you know, the guys at Deloitte and we'll talk about that uh, now. I mean, it's all around the positioning and there's some insight and people use that for a bit of benchmarking. Right. Um, you know, what's the answer? I think you, you need to, to look at each piece of information. You trust the brand, you trust individuals. I think it more comes down to the individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, so it's Brian and Lance. I think that report was really good. I think yeah, uh, I the, seen the CPO survey, the Deloitte CPO yeah, survey. I think you press it and the video comes out. I, 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 it can't be that hard to do in, in PDF. <laughs> right. They did, it, they did it really well. And yeah. it kind of popped up and it worked. You know, it was good to see Lance. And I haven't met Brian before, but, um, I, I feel like I know him already. So he's uh, super smart and there's a brand behind it as well, more than just an image. Yeah, actually, I interviewed Brian last year for the 2016 and then 2017, I interviewed Lance. So um, let's talk about the Deloitte CPO survey. It's something I always kind of, I've always looked forward to getting as kind of a, just a, a bit of a pulse. There's so many surveys out there. It's kind of difficult sometimes to know which one to turn to. And Deloitte's always been one that seems to be one that I've respected, I've trusted and uh, kind of awaited. So the latest one came out a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, something that was really interesting that stood out to me was the fact that um, CPOs talk about the fact they want more influence. But the reality is that um, the levers that we pull still remain the same old tactical short term you know, let's try and get some cost savings kind of levers. So we talk about wanting influence in one hand and yet continue to do the same things on the other. Um, at the same time, I was reading that like three quarters of respondents claim that they have the ear of the C-suite, you know, whatever that really means. But at the same time, there was another counterpoint in the data that said that influence remains the same. So we continue to say that we have more influence with the C-suite, but then when it comes, or that we're, we're more respected, that our C-suite wants to work with us, but then when it comes to influence, we say that our influence has stayed the same. And those kind of numbers don't tie up to me. Yeah, I mean, look, I can't say that I get that excited about a, a survey coming out. Mm -hmm. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have it in my diary right. when it comes through. It sounds like you do, so you, you, you like the Deloitte server. That's because I want to interview them, I think. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, and it is very pretty. Um, and actually, to uh, if anyone's got good good research coming out, please send it to me. Right. Um, I'm sure people can work out my email address by now. But um, you send it to me. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to read it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a, a whole lot of bullshit, really, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So how can procurement say what the C-suites think of them? Right. Now, if you ask the board what you think of procurement and you did that in a standard way and and maybe on this research that's what they've done but it sounds like cpos are surveying themselves on it yeah like saying um, that we think that we're liked more well you know that's great yeah. so i think you know can you really trust that number because it's mm -hmm. it's it's quite it's qualitative but you know a group of people have said that so and again i'm sure the guys at deloitte said that so i, I think it'd be a lot easier if you, you had the board doing that and then you could actually understand where it comes right. from so i think you need it um the, the the interesting one is i think it was um it was a few posts there was a there was a slide from uh, the cto of johnson and johnson talking about balancing act of mm -hmm. procurement short-term profitability against long-term growth right uh, jordan who uh, you know uh, from the old street labs team also did one about you know is savings um, the most re um, cost savings, the most ridiculous thing in the world, or something like that. And he took a, uh, a Buffett view on it as well. Yeah. And that's, there are, there's definitely a commercial edge to make sure it's there. But um, I think there's a real challenge now. So, you know, the savings that you're making for a, an organization may give you the short term quarter or mm -hmm. year 
position that you might be because your, your market might be tight. And that, that can be different across different parts of the business as well in terms of functions. But what's the cost of the cost saving? Right. And so I'm not saying that all cost savings are bad, but some of those ones are really going to stop your growth or your innovation or your competitive mm-hmm. edge. And, and no one's looking at this is the op- opportunity cost of the, the cost saving as well. And when procurement execs are targeted on savings, then that's what they deliver. And, you know, sometimes a business function will have savings as a, or profitability as a savings as a target. They'll yeah. say, here are my career objectives to, to do it, and I've got savings. And I believe somewhere in here we have business partnering. We're all doing a really good job of it. Or I don't know, uh, Again, I have read it in part, but there's a common trade that we're getting better at business partnering. Well, the business, and you look at their objectives, probably doesn't have a savings target as a core objective. Mm-hmm. They have growth. They're trying to you know, go into new markets, launch new products more quickly, all these types of things. Um, but there's not a savings one. It's the FD and procurement putting that in there. And then mm-hmm. we say we're business partners. So right. for me, a business partner looks at the objectives of the business and then delivers to achieve that. Yeah. Or when procurement talks about business partnering, again, sweeping statement, I'm not saying everyone, what they're saying is they are now getting the business to help them achieve their savings targets. But you're not actually giving and delivering against their objectives. Right. And that's not your number one priority. And if you're just working with the business to achieve savings for your numbers and you're, you haven't got the high priority on their objectives, then you're not partnering. You are just call it partnering to get your savings numbers through and pack ourselves on the back. Again, these are big sweeping statements. I'm sure there's some very more mature progressive companies out there that do it differently, but there is a, there is a challenge that balancing act as the CTO of Johnson and Johnson talks about. So I think that needs to, to look differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I think there, although I put a post on LinkedIn about the percentage looking at. Um, supply collaboration and, and there's this theme around uh, procurement or supply enabled innovation. Um, you still have that, that saving side at the top mm-hmm. and, and all these other trends sometimes reducing, but also their perceived value is increasing, but their efforts is dropping around the value and that's a bit confusing. Um, I think Lance, I saw his video and it was like, I think he was kind of bringing that out. I'm not sure. I haven't listened to the podcast and, and what came out of it. So, that's the challenge. Again, I yeah. should read this in a little bit more. But the uh, the interesting section for that uh, was the value and collaboration piece. I think they did a really nice uh, a really nice section on that. So um, I can't remember the page, but on page fifteen, if you're looking at the the report, collaboration with business and suppliers to deliver value. We've got two paragraphs in there, which I think are really well written, mm-hmm. uh, and it ch- kind of challenges. Your business partnering, supplier partnering should actually be very much the same approach and what you're trying to achieve. And then that's where you deliver the value. Yeah. Um, so I like their writing on that side. Um, I think that was the best section um, and, and, and some of the incremental actions and ex- exponential actions. That was a good section, those three pages. That's, that's the part I read. Right. It, some, anything that comes up with collaboration that, that drew your eyes to that straight away. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> mark out the stuff like that. It's all good. It's all good. I mean, it's a good report. Um, but the talent one's an interesting one. Yeah. I also challenge that. Uh, I think people question whether the, the 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 teams they have can actually drive and do this new stuff. And the challenge for me is that the, the procurement leaders they need to lead. Yeah, I it's enabling the teams to do it, isn't it? Uh, so we have to create the environment yeah. to do it. So if we create an environment when all their only target is savings and we say we want to innovate and collaborate and then the, the CPOs say, well, we haven't got the team to achieve it, you have to create the environment where right. they can do more than savings to, to do it. And they can do business partnering to deliver the business objectives, which may not be savings, but we only target ourselves on it. So I think it's the procurement executives that you need to take a, a look in the, in the mirror um, and then try and change both the KPIs and their position in the business. And at only that point, when they've done and created the environment, can they really question the talent below them? They should be questioning their own talent. But there's a whole lot of things on top of it. There's a lot of these savings numbers right. that have been built up over a period of time and get reported in the annual report. How do you 
how do you kind of roll those down and say, well, savings are, are good. We're doing commercial part and here's the opportunities we're creating. And that's, that's the, the hard part. So I, I, I do understand it's a bit of a challenge. Here. Yeah, I think there's some courage that comes in it as well, because it's, you know, the natural instinct when you have a savings target is to focus on savings. But I always felt that, and, you know, my experience in, in, as a buyer was always that if I focused on other things, the savings would come. And, you know, they did come, but you'd focus on, again, what the business wants. And you'd then be able to engineer what the business wants in a way that allows you to generate savings, at least to show that if that's how you're going to be measured, it shows that way. But you're actually taking a different approach than just going and saying, OK, how can I save money on this? It's how can I give the business what they want and do it in a way that allows savings to come out of the back end. Um, and it's just a little bit counterintuitive, but I was always able to meet my targets like that. So I think that, yes, it's not. You know, it's not going to work for everybody all the time. But I think that just by not thinking about savings as the first thing you want to achieve doesn't mean you're not going to achieve achieve savings. Yeah, and I, I'm making some big sweeping statements, but I, and I know that people deliver a lot of value beyond savings as well. But as an overall part, this is one of the biggest challenges that we we need to address. So. But no, sorry, uh, the, what, what what jumped out of you from the Deloitte when I, I've gone off on a tangent like I normally do? <laughs> well, there was the growth. It was interesting that the, there was a a feeling that the business wanted supporting growth. And yet, as I was kind of mentioning before, the fact that even though that's the fact, we're still using the old old levers. So we're, all, we're still doing the same things. So it's like we're doing, and again, generalization, but we're doing the same things and expecting different results. And the business is even looking for different things from us, but we're still doing the things that we know are the best. So I think that's something that came out to it to me. The other thing, it was really interesting what you're saying about talent and how we always look at talent as, well, how do we improve the soft skills of our team and how do we bring people in from outside the procurement? But when you take a step back, you know, there's very, very few people within the procurement professional who don't want to, who only want to focus on cost savings. You know, we all want to focus on bringing more value to the business. We all want to be more involved in the business. So the point you made about leadership, I think, is really important that, if you create that environment for people, yes, some people aren't going to be able to come along on the journey, but we can't necessarily say that we need new blood because I don't have the capabilities in my team if you haven't created that environment for them to be successful, like you said. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, I mean, we're lucky to, to at Old Street, we're working with some really cool companies and progressive uh, leaders and that, so um, I got you know, I, I thank them for that. Um, actually, it was a, an ex McKinsey guy who was working in in one of those companies that actually sat down with me and said, look, you know, as you look at that supplier collaboration and driving that value beyond savings, you have to remember that you need to try and transform a company from the savings focus. So mm -hmm. they have projects, so internal projects or ones with suppliers which are going to deliver savings or um, risk mitigation or uh, supply simplification reduction yeah. in numbers, yeah. Um, but you need to make sure that the the projects that you're running then, which are generating value beyond savings, are also viewed in the same one. So it may start that you're doing 90%, which are very much savings and, mm -hmm. and cash flow and, and all those things that we know and love, which are in, in the report there. Um, but you also then need to show and start quantifying some of those ones. We talk about value chips within yeah. uh, Visible and then, you know, the projects that, that people manage in there have value chips. So there's some sort of opportunity of delivering that value. It doesn't mean that you get in there, but you have a pipeline of projects with different stages and you are trying to achieve that. And the business can start seeing that, which means they can start seeing the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they're involved in those project, projects as well. Right. Um, and that, that starts getting exciting for the, the business as well. And the guys, uh, again, is one of the pharma companies, they talk about value stories. So short snippets, mm -hmm. the stories around those projects and just collect them and distribute them and communicate them. Uh, and I think that's what you have to do. You know, you have to be able, you know, a communication channel that uh, slightly different, but how do you give your category managers, how do you give the procurement execs, how do you give your CFO, um, the marketing function, he, little stories here, little stories uh -huh. there of the value and it starts generating as well. So I think there's a communications piece which needs to go in there and somehow you have to reward your team for, for coming up, not coming up with those stories, capturing those stories right. and bringing them back it's as well. kind of showcasing them. You know, the, um, the learning and development program I'm working on right now around supply risk, a big part of that is going out into the business and finding examples of people doing the right thing and then showcasing that to the rest of the organization so that, you know, people can learn from each other and learn from their peers and kind of be inspired by that rather than it just be, 
somebody talking to them in a workshop and telling them, well, this is what you should do. Because just bringing it to life, bringing things to life, one, it incents people, I think, that are showcased that they're doing the right thing and they want to continue doing the right thing. But it there's just something about learning in that way in a short kind of little video, short little podcast even, about something that somebody's already doing rather than just learning from something off a piece of e-learning or, um, you know, just somebody in a workshop, as I said, kind of talking off some slides. Yeah, I've started to see it. I mean, uh, some, some some teams came to our office and they uh, they came along with, I think it was an iPhone, and, you know, we had our, our, our bigger camera there, but they, they came and did an interview with me. It mm-hmm. was a three-minute interview. It probably turned out to be a 10-minute interview once I rambled on. <laughs> but they start to do that a lot more. They're just catching videos from around. So mm-hmm. I think this kind of, um, you know, the way that we take in a, a kind of, create content and, and distribute it is definitely going to the corporates as well. I, I think the other part is look, big organizations, there is a lot of history, there's a lot of process and there's politics and, and X, Y, Z. Right. And, you know, I just have to uh, understand what's going on and, and things should change more quickly. Uh, I guess that pace of change is the important part. How, how do we help organizations start changing the dial, the lever around this so they can start, you know, creating the environment there as well. And I think, they need some help around that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are particular projects where you can you can you can move the dial more quickly, um, but also it's making sure they can articulate it. So back to your piece around content and so forth. I think there's some great content that can help it. I'd say those paragraphs from Deloitte right. um, are great ones for people to borrow and properly reference to the Deloitte report um, and start putting it into their their own words yeah. for their own team and organisation. So. Um, you know, being a wordsmith is a, a certain talent. Jordan in my team is our mm-hmm. wordsmith. He's, he's awesome on it. Um, I'm not so good. Although as the editor of the magazine, I had a very good <laughs> deputy editor and, and, and subs and so forth like that. But yeah, so there's some great wording and good positioning. But if you just collect everyone, a lot of other companies. Right. 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 Sorry, Siri's talking to me over here for some reason. No um, <laughs> um, so it's how do you create that into a proper story for your yeah. organization? And, and that's the part. And then you might need to bring someone else to the wordsmith thing. We're, we're not, you know, people aren't great. So I have a great wordsmith outside of the business. A guy called Gabby. He is awesome. Works with big companies. Mm-hmm. How do you reposition? How do you get the, the hairs in the back of your uh, your arm come up when you talk about your yeah. function and how it helps the it's business? Like the narrative but, uh, around it. Yeah. And uh, it needs to be authentic and mm-hmm. it needs to be original. And I think quite often when I see procurement, uh, statements, missions, um, they're just a bit chunky and, and not that inspiring as well. So we're, I think, 40 minutes in. What do you want to do? Shall we uh, Shall we go with the other thing that we had to talk about, which is Alex's post, or should we hold off on that until next time? Um, we kind of touch on that, but then let's, let's yeah. come back to a, a, another time, I think, on that one. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, we're 40 minutes in, so let's uh, pick out some other parts there. I know you're very keen to talk about Trump, so I think we should have a bit of Trump yeah, in, yeah. in this session. Otherwise, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> no, I say that, you know, that's what I've... Actually, you asked me what I've done for the last month. I've tried to stay off Twitter and Facebook as much as possible, you know, failing badly, just to try and make sense of everything that's happening. Although I'm wary of also not bringing too much of politics into this. Um, but it's all very interesting, and it changes on a day-to-day basis. Um, you know what's going on but I think again it comes down to we talked about at the beginning it's just preparing for risk like knowing what we don't know what the impact of a lot of things that are going to go on because frankly I'm not sure if the president knows what he's going to do from one day to the next and so how can you plan for that so in my mind it's just we know we all need and I'm, I'm pretty passionate about as passionate as you can get anyway about risk and risk mitigation I I was in a um, financial services company that had to take bailout money and uh, back in 2008, I joined about two weeks before we took bailout money. And so we had to transition the entire company. It was one that was a finance arm of an auto manufacturer. No risk consideration whatsoever. We had to go from that to being a bank within a fortnight. So then the Federal Reserve gave us 18 months to basically change the entire company to one that's true focus was about risk mitigation versus before where there was just no consideration of risk, which is why we ended up needing to take bailout money. So I think that the procurement just has a much bigger place, a much bigger role to play in risk, the identification, the management, the mitigation of risk than we do. 
and I see more and more companies, you know, be more progressive in that space. Um, you know, thinking about risk more than it just being a financial health check, which is what I think most of us at least did back in the day. So recognizing that there's more to risk than that, but I still think that as a function, we can do a lot more about um, helping our business understand and plan for all the different scenarios that may happen because of the the unknowns that are out there. Because, you know, you can be sure at the moment, the C-suite don't know any more than you and I over what the impact of all these decisions that are going to be made. So they're just as in the, not in the know as we are. So it's something that we can really do to bring information, bring data, bring insights around that will actually help the business in a way that's more than just, we can save you some money. And so once you start to do that, it starts to help you be seen as, you know, there's more value that you can bring and you can kind of build on that. Yeah, it's interesting. I I mean, we can go into a little bit more, but very, um, I'm asking you to be concise and I I can't be concise. Mm -hmm. How do you you structure risk management within a a procurement team? So you've got 500 people in the procurement team. So who, who, who owns risk management and then how does it cascade? into the, the rest of the procurement team and then into the business. Is there a simple way of doing that? Or? It, it is very situational because it depends on how much the organization cares about risk. You know, when you're in a regulated environment um, like financial services, then the business itself has to have its own risk, you know, like enterprise risk programs. So you have much more of a structured kind of role to play within that because you feed up to something bigger than you are. In organizations that don't have that, it's a bit, a bit more inconsistent. And so to me, it's really, you can have a couple of people. So I would always recommend you have somebody who's responsible for a third party risk management program. You know, they're the person that's going to pull it all together, but, and they can provide you with the tools, you know, the templates you need to start to understand where the risks exist. But risk is really an individual thing to me. It's like the individual buyer, the category lead needs to have responsibility for risk for their portfolio. And they can use tools that are provided to them by the car. But it's really a conversation because risk is so subjective too. You know, I know there's a lot of technology that will change that in terms of data, but most companies don't have access to it. So it's really the perception of risk with your stakeholder. So a lot of it is individual based right now. So you don't need to build a big structure, you know, to put something in place, but you need at least some some way of being able to determine Here's my universe of 20,000 suppliers. Here is the 20 that I think I really need to focus on. Because that's where you really get down to what the true risks are. Yeah, no, it's an interesting one. I mean, again, I'd love to go into a bit more detail on that one as well. Because you know, you've got the technology, whether it's an Achilles or a Rav over mm-hmm. there and, and, and so forth, starting to, to pick that up. But um, well, it's never just the technology. It's right. technology plus services on top. So I think Arava has come back into the fold recently because... I guess the Gempax, the Infosys, and, and a lot of those other companies in that space now use uh, Aravo and, and doing it. But, you know, you get your first 6,000 suppliers on, but getting to the 50,000 yeah. is an expensive one where the Achilles one kind of made sense, but you've already made the decision on that one. So um, I think there's a, there's a big thing around the compliance piece, the overall supply base risk, and then the important 20, you know, um, which is probably, they're probably in your top. 100 or 500 suppliers. Right. It's the suppliers who, at the end of the day, are either going, or either have access to information that um, you don't want to get out into the world, and they can be smaller suppliers, or it's the ones that are material to your value proposition, and it's the same ones that will be as part of you know a supplier collaboration effort because those are the ones that your company can't survive without. So you can pretty, you can do it from a, a, there's kind of a couple of ways to do it. One is like you look at inherent product and service risk. So it's like you take a taxonomy view. So of all your taxonomy of things you buy, what's really critical? And there you can wipe out the vast majority of suppliers and things you buy. Because, you know, most of the things are commoditized. You can switch them pretty easily. There may be a little bit of pain if you have to go without them for a couple of weeks, but it's not going to shut down the business. So that immediately takes you down to, well, let's say here's 200 suppliers or 200 things that you buy, and then you can go a little bit more deep onto those. So it's not like you have to do measurement or monitoring of every single supplier in your supply base. It's just figuring out who are the ones that being without them or being without the product and service that they provide, you know, would have the biggest impact on your business. 
say, what we should do, um, we should get someone who, who's really in the know on the cybersecurity side. Yeah. Um, cause I think that's relevant for everyone, you know, more, more systems coming through as well. So maybe we can do a cyber security mm-hmm. risk, uh, session. I'm not sure it needs to be a monthly one, but I'll be keen to, to listen in or, or do a call on that one as well. But, uh, that's cool. Um, so that, yeah, that's an interesting one. And, uh, the rest, I'd say, okay, let's, uh, let's do more. If you've got any articles as well, it'll be good to, uh, send them over yeah. or, uh, post them below or, or however we, we exchange those as well. That's cool. And uh, we're running out of time or we've overrun already. What's uh, what's coming up in the next uh, month for you? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting month um, if all goes well. So a couple of things that I'm working on. So I'm working on a redesign for out of procurement. And that will be we, – we're really looking at going beyond the podcast. So we talked a little bit about procurement media before. And one of the things we didn't talk about is that, you know, I think that we need to be – embracing a lot more thought leadership from the outside so what are some of those macro trends that are happening how will they actually impact procurement and you know i'm not sure that we do a great job within procurement of of really doing that at the moment so we want to look at um how do we start looking outward to the the bigger wider world and how the things that are happening in the white big wide world impact procurement more um and also just looking at different channels so it's been a podcast so far and you know has been really happy with how it's going but you know, maybe it's time to just expand it so that people who aren't podcast listeners still have a place to go. And you know, we want to start practicing with video, dabbling with video um, and with um, written content as well. So that should go out yeah, in we, the next couple of weeks. That would be cool. And we should we should dabble more because we can, we can stream from any social right. platform. I think other than actually LinkedIn have now got these influencer videos coming up, but I think you can't, live stream so i guess linkedin will do it fairly soon but instagram right. twitter facebook yeah facebook live other- seems to be the rage at the moment or at least not in procurement but you know in other verticals and that's something that's yeah. interesting to me as well whether procurement as a function you know as as us within procurement is really ready to embrace that kind of technology as a way of um consuming content right. I, I, if i knew you were alive once a week Mm-hmm. And it wasn't when Liverpool were playing football or when I'm doing something <laughs> with the girls or uh, so that, you know, I'd dial in. Mm-hmm. I, I think the, I think that consistency of creating right. content as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that some live stuff would be cool. We yeah. should just do a live one. Right, we should just do this live one month. I don't know how we do that technology, but I'm sure we can work that yeah, out. We'll find but, somebody um, smarter than us to tell us. Yeah, um, but let's do that. I, I think let's play around with it. I'm, I'm up for playing around. So maybe we get some themes. Actually, it's one thing that I've got. I've got a new new camera here. So video is one of my um, things that we're going to do a lot more of. So I'm going to Mobile World Congress mm-hmm. the week after next. So that's in Barcelona for a couple of days. So I, I get to spend over there and, and condense myself in the world of tech. And the other challenge on that, I think Deloitte maybe or someone else, how many procurement execs have got someone from their function going to the Mobile World Congress? Yeah, I bet there's not many. No. So if they're not going there to scout new innovation and also talked about for those ones, and it's someone else's job to do it, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. I mean, I, I want to know how many procurement people are at, uh, at the event. Um, that, that's an interesting one. Um, so the other thing is with this mass adoption of kale that's going on in my both my household and now Shorty's Shorty's taking up the kale consumption in San Francisco. Um, one of the other guys, the, the new designer, he's on a, a six a six pack challenge. So he's he's yeah. trying to get his six pack for the, the uh, for July time. So I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try and join that. I'm not sure if be successful, but I always like these challenges mm-hmm. and, and a bit of body hacking. So. I think give me by the end of July and uh, I'm going to try and see if I can at least try and catch up with Max. I'm not sure if I'll achieve it. So that's the other one. A little bit more health followed from your side in terms of the running uh, and taking the dog out for a walk. But um, yeah, how do I do that with all the travel? That's yeah. what I have to work out. Yeah, you know, I'm well, I'm training. We'll see how it goes because, you know, anyone who can see the video can see that, you know, I'm no Mo Farah. But, um, you know, I've been trying to um, I've been training for the LA Marathon, which is in March. Oh, and cool. I've not really put that out anywhere because, you know, I'm not really, I don't know if I'll be able to do it other than walk it. Um, so we'll see, you know, I, it was part of a challenge in LA. There was a 10K, which was, you know, simple enough. Um, there was the half, a, a half marathon, 
in Pasadena three weeks ago, I think it was, and it happened to be on the rainiest day, you know, in the last three years. Um, and then the third part of that is the LA Marathon, which is a month away from now. So we'll uh, see. I'm kind of hoping to be able to do it because um, I've never done anything like that before. We'll see how it goes. How you do it. You'll smash it. I, I haven't done a marathon and I actually it's not one of my ambitions to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great, great thing. I did some, I did a Tough Mudder with yeah. Shorty and, and some of my mates. I think that was a really good fun. I enjoyed the training for it. Um, I'm, you're having water and I'm having a, <laughs> a, a beer on a Thursday night. I'm it on is, holiday today. It is two o'clock in the afternoon it's, here. So, okay, yeah. so it, uh, I thought you were going to say it's vodka and you're no. just uh, sneaking in. This is my day. This is my day's holiday between mm-hmm. uh, Christmas and uh, and uh, Easter. So I got a day off with the, this kids on school holiday. So I wouldn't normally drink during the week. But yeah, I, I think that's cool. So let me know how it goes on the yeah. running. I'll keep you in check on this training stuff, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll let you know my kale consumption and, right. uh, and my kettlebells are going as well. <laughs> but it's a good way to keep us all going on that as well. So we should probably wrap up yep. and uh, you get on with your your day. Um, but uh, let's let's see how to do it, and let's uh, we'll distribute this. It'll be good to get more feedback from uh, the people watching, yeah. uh, listening as well. Uh, we want to refine it, and, uh, and we should try and get um, a guest in as well. So yeah, um, we, we talked about that last month, and I think time just got the better of us. So uh, we th- we definitely want to kind of go in that direction, don't we? Bring in some right, guests, let's... And have people listen to more than just you and I droning on for fifty minutes. Okay, so there we go. Next one, we're going to have a guest. Mm-hmm. And we'll have to work the technology out for right. more than two people. But we'll do a guest on the next one. Um, and now we've got, with your marathon and so forth, to find a, a good person who can yeah. keep us in check yeah. and not bounce as much as me. Well, uh, for any of the notes that us, that go with today's video, we talked about a few links. Those are going to be at uh, this month in procurement. Just head there. You'll see the February um, the February show there. We actually have it on iTunes now, its own uh, location on iTunes last month we put it in the feed for out of procurement and um, yeah it's going to have its own feed there so just subscribe in your podcast app and um, thanks for listening if you made it through all this way then you're either um, you know bored doing something or got stuck running and you didn't know where the uh, next podcast button was so we appreciate you sticking by us cool all right well good to catch up with everyone and uh, I'll, I'll see you uh, I'll hear about your running but uh, yeah have a great day I'll catch up in a few weeks you too Mark take care alright cheers then. Bye. cheers bye